Welcome to Radiologist Headquarters. Today we'll be talking about ultrasound of intussusception. I'm Dr. Dan Koval, and this episode is sponsored by Samsung Ultrasound. The fabulous images you're about to see were obtained on a Samsung RS85 Prestige ultrasound unit. I'm going to show three cases of intussusception, highlighting key teaching points throughout. Let's start with case one. So this was a six-year-old female presenting to the emergency department with a few days of colicky right lower quadrant pain. All right, so we're starting with a view of the right lower quadrant here. This is the cecal apex, and then here's the appendix extending off. And the appendix looks normal, but we don't really see the appendiceal tip. As we continue to evaluate that right lower quadrant, we see that there's this abnormal thickening at the apex of the cecum. We do see normal blood flow within the cecal wall. And then on short axis, we see this targetoid appearance of the bowel. This outer hypoechoic or dark area corresponds to the outer colon. And then we have this central target in bowel appearance. As we look at that further, we see that there's also echogenic material within this central aspect of the bowel corresponding to the mesenteric fat. Here's that outer hypoechoic bowel wall. And that contains the ileum here as well as the appendix. And we also see these lobular hypoechoic solid areas, and that corresponds to mesenteric lymph nodes. And this is very typical for an ileocolic intussusception. Let's look at this on real-time imaging. There's the appendix here in the right lower quadrant, and it's getting pulled into the colon along with this mesenteric fat. And you can also see the terminal ileum is getting pulled in, so this is all within colon. And then now we see these globular hypoechoic areas corresponding to enlarged mesenteric lymph nodes. There's the appendix, and it's reaching the cecal apex, which also has a thickened wall. So again, here we have the appendix that's getting pulled in with this mesenteric fat here. This is all within the colon, along with the terminal ileum. And this is very typical for an ileocolic intussusception. Let's look at some key points, which you can also find in the show notes. So an intussusception is when you have bowel being pulled into itself or into neighboring bowel. And there are two types, ileocolic and small bowel to small bowel intussusception. And it's really the ileocolic type we're most concerned with because if that's not reduced, it can lead to bowel ischemia and perforation. Now, most intussusceptions occur in children over the age of three months. And there's usually no lead point in children, unlike adults where the intussusception is usually brought about by a mass. And in children, it's suspected that that is because it's often secondary to hypertrophic lymphoid tissue that develops after an infection. And classically, these patients will present with a triad of colicky abdominal pain, vomiting, and a palpable abdominal mass, but that's actually seen in fewer than 50% of patients. There may also be a history of red currant jelly stool, which is stool mixed with blood and mucus, and that can be seen in the setting of bowel ischemia. And the treatment for ileocolic intussusception is enema with air or contrast material. And in this case, the patient was successfully treated with an air enema. The ileocolic intussusception was reduced. Now, some vocabulary, and don't worry, there won't be a spelling test. The intussusceptum is the name of the prolapsing bowel that's pulled into the intussuscipiens, which receives the bowel. So in this case, for an ileocolic intussusception, the ileum is the intussusceptum, and the colon is the intussuscipiens. And in the workup of intussusception, ultrasound is typically considered the gold standard because the sensitivity and specificity are quite high, 98%, and the false negative rate is extremely low, less than 1%, meaning that if you have a negative ultrasound for intussusception, that's quite reassuring. And some of the typical findings include a targetoid appearance of the intussusception viewed on short axis, as in this case with concentric rings. And on long axis, it may mimic the appearance of a kidney, yielding the pseudo-kidney sign. But there are some other more specific findings that allow us on ultrasound to differentiate an ileocolic intussusception, which again is the more concerning type, from the small bowel, small bowel intussusception. So the most obvious is just the location. Iliocolic intussusceptions tend to occur in the region of the right lower quadrant, since that's where the iliocolic junction is. And we won't see a normal iliocolic junction in these cases. Also, these intussusceptions have a hypercoic center, typically representing mesenteric fat that's pulled into the intussusception. And if the diameter of the hypercoic core is greater than that of the outer wall, as in this case, that's more suggestive of an iliocolic type. Also, lymph nodes may be included inside an ileocolic intussusception. Ileocolic also tends to have a larger AP diameter. If it's more than 2 centimeters, that's much more likely ileocolic, and a longer length, greater than 3 centimeters. So if we look back at our case here, you can see that the AP dimension is greater than 2 centimeters, 2.2 centimeters, and the length is greater than 3 centimeters, 3.8 centimeters in this case. Very typical for an ileocolic intussusception. Now, what about a small bowel, small bowel intussusception? 
Well, here's a different patient, case two. This was a seven-year-old male presenting with abdominal pain, diarrhea, and vomiting for about a week. And here we see another target sign, right? Concentric rings here telling us that there's an interception. We could see this is the intussusceptum and then the surrounding intussuscipients. But what's different in this case? Well, one is the location. Here we are in the left lower quadrant, not in the right lower quadrant. And we do have this echogenic core here representing mesenteric fat, but it does not appear thicker than the surrounding bowel wall. Also, when we measure the AP diameter of this intussusception, it's only 1.4 centimeters. So that's less than 2 centimeters. Now let's turn sagittally and look at the long axis here. And again, this is the intussusceptum, the bowel that's prolapsing into the surrounding intussuscipients. And you can see that this is also much shorter. This only measures 2 centimeters in length as opposed to the greater than 3 centimeters that we had on the previous case. So these findings are all typical for a small bowel, small bowel intussusception. Moreover, in this case, this was observed to spontaneously reduce during the examination, showing that it was just a transient incidental finding. And this required no additional management. All right, let's finish with a complicated case of intussusception. This was a six-month-old female with a one-day history of non-bilious projectile vomiting and a concerning history of bloody diarrhea. So turning to the right lower quadrant, we see a target appearance here of the bowel containing mesenteric fat and lymph nodes, typical for an ileocolic intussusception. And then we also see some free fluid here, this anechoic simple free fluid, which that by itself is not typically concerning. It can be seen in about 50% of intussusception cases. But as we look further at this ileocolic intussusception, what else do we see? Well, there's also fluid within the intussuscipients, and that's more of a concerning finding. We can see that here as well. Also, notice that the wall is heterogeneous and hypoechoic, and the bowel has a tethered appearance containing mesenteric fat and bowel within the colon. And as we look at this further, we can see that it's quite large on long axis. It measures nearly 7 centimeters, so that's much larger than 3 centimeters. And again, we see fluid within the intussuscipients, as well as some fluid surrounding the intussusception. On real-time imaging, we see just how complex this intussusception is. There's the prolapse loop within the central aspect. It's rather long, and then it has a tethered appearance in between these loops. And so this was not able to be successfully reduced with air enema and went to surgery where this bowel was found to be necrotic and needed to be resected. Some findings to be aware of that raise suspicion on ultrasound for ischemia or necrosis and increased risk of enema reduction failure. One is the fluid trapped within the intussuscipients, as we had in this case. If there's a lack of internal vascular flow on color Doppler within the intussusceptum, that can be concerning. And also if the bowel wall is irregular or has decreased vascularity, that may indicate that the bowel wall is friable increasing the risk for perforation. So if any of these findings are evident on ultrasound, that's important to alert the team that surgery needs to be on standby owing to the higher than normal risk of perforation. All right, thank you so much for joining me and I hope you found this educational. Thank you again to our sponsor, Samsung Ultrasound. If you like this lecture, a great free way to support us is to subscribe to the podcast on Spotify or Apple or by clicking the subscribe button on YouTube. I also post interesting teaching files throughout the week that you can find by following us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and Reddit, or by clicking the YouTube community tab. Until next time, radiology is life.